Okay, welcome David Addison, ITV Motorsport commentator. Thank you very much for coming on and getting involved. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. New year, new season beckons and um, looking forward to it. We're, we're still hearing ghastly things about you know what tier we might all be in yeah. and who knows what we'll be looking at by April when we want the touring car season in particular to start. But um, on, on paper, with what we're hearing and, and uh, new cars, new drivers, a bit of shuffling around, should be a good year. Yeah, there's definitely lots of uh, lots to think about and looks to look forward to. What did you think of last season's BTCC? Obviously, very different to to other years with with obviously what's been affected by COVID. But the strange thing was that you're right; it did feel different in many ways. Obviously, because of the the lack of a crowd. But I, I don't think the racing suffered at all. No, um, definitely, I was very interested to to see whether um this is not pr quite the right phrase maybe but whether people play to the gallery you know whether when when a race got underway drivers were conscious that there were forty thousand people on the bank at Alton park for example or there weren't and whether because uh, you hear drivers certainly think back to formula one lewis hamilton nigel mansell british grand prix you hear drivers talk about the difference a crowd can make and i was interested to know whether not having spectators there would in any way affect the racing. Absolutely did not. And therefore, yeah. um, you know, that first weekend at Donington Park, Mark Cross, who was the television director, did a really grand job of not making it apparent that there was nobody in the background. And yeah. at the end of the first touring car race, Tim Harvey and I looked at each other and said, you wouldn't know the difference really, because yeah. the racing was just fantastic. Uh, so it was a strange season, yes, in not having people around. And it was a little bit different because it was shorter by three races. <laughs> Uh, and what was good about it, actually, was the fact that the calendar was a bit more jumbled. You know, you didn't go to the obvious places in the same order. Um, and we finished on the Indy circuit, not the Grand Prix circuit. And, you know, it, it did have a little bit of variety to it. And, and, of course, the calendar was a bit of a makeshift one, in a sense, because of the uh, light in the day, because of the number of, of, of days that ITV could provide. Um, but it turned out to be a very good competitive season. And I think to have... Ash Sutton and Colin Turkington, two rear-wheel drive stars going head-to-head -head in the last round, yeah. was fantastic. And if you think about it, yeah, right, Ash is a champion of seasons past, like Colin, but you had WSR with its, check, with its, its great history, manufacturer team, and over here, you've got Ash in the, in the Infinity, yeah. effectively a, new, a brand new car built over the winter, um, run by an independent team, taking on the big boys, taking on yeah. WSR, BMW, Colin Turkington. And if you add WSR and Colin CVs together, you know, there's not much they've not won. <laughs> them. And yet this little underdog, almost, dare one say, one car team, because Ash was getting much better results than Aidan Moffat was in that car. That came along and, and took them on and beat them. And that, I think, is, is a great credit to the, the, everybody involved in that. Yeah, definitely. I, I certainly enjoyed it. it it felt it was very strange waiting all that time for for it to start. I was, yeah, yeah I was so so looking forward to it. So, and obviously, thanks to you and ITV Motorsport for bringing such good coverage to us at home. Well, we had to do it slightly differently as well because, and again, I don't know whether people noticed this to begin with, but we couldn't run on board cameras because that was part of uh, ITV's um, health and safety and, and and risk assessment that they didn't want. Uh, to, to put anybody in jeopardy by going into garages, into cars, to have to set cameras up. Um, so the fir it was really up until, what was it, Silverstone, I think, that we, we, we didn't yeah. have onboards. Um, but again, the rating was so good that you could use all the external shots, and that was, that was uh, okay. Um, and obviously, we couldn't do grid walks. Uh, yeah. So Louise wasn't on the grid. She had her own little, little studio in which to interview people. Drivers would get from their cars. They'd go to a garage. There'd be a what's called a locked off camera, which would just sit there all day and, and, and they'd go and stand in front of that and they could hear Louise and speak to the camera. And that's how we were doing interviews. So it was all rather different. Um, you know, we, we couldn't go to the paddock. Um, we had to broadcast from, from a, a specially adapted uh, truck within the TV compound. So instead of going up and down the pit lane or in and out of garages and transporters and finding mechanics and drivers and team owners and whatnot to go and get information, all that had to be done uh, by WhatsApp, by text, by phone call, by Twitter, by, you know, any means we could possibly do. Um, so Tim and I had to work in a different way. But hopefully, um, 
we didn't miss anything through the action. You know, the racing, as you say, was was really good, and 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 I think that everybody involved in it, from ITV's point of view, yes, in a different way, um, still did a, a an outstanding job. Yeah, it was really good. Obviously, everyone obviously had to work very hard to get to get it all sorted in time, but it was it was brilliant. Yeah, yeah, and and the fact that you know that the, the everything fitted. We still got all the support races. Um, yeah okay we, we move channels on occasions to go was it ITV2 I think we, we were yeah. on for a couple of, of occasions um but you know it was still there and and maybe people as they were channel punching that day that wouldn't normally go to ITV4 fell across touring cars on ITV2 and stayed and watched it and enjoyed it and we've got some new fans oh yes definitely um what what were your highlights of last season there were probably quite a few. One of them was the first round at Donington because yeah. we were back racing. You know, we had all of that uh, frustration, um, that, that, that downtime. We were itching to get going and to go back into the paddock at Donington and to see people and to hear cars and to have that <laughs> colour and that bustle again um, was great. So that was certainly a highlight. Um, I think Croft was a highlight because there were some good races that yeah. really perked up the championship because Colin was in strife and then Ash had his tangle with Jake Hill and, and put himself in, in trouble that way. Um, Brown's Hatch was, was a, the, the um, Grand Prix circuit was a highlight because we had some very good racing that day. And uh, again, things were, were um, random, if you like, because of the punctures <laughs> that affected the, the motor-based Fords. Silverstone was a highlight with Ollie Jackson's uh, first win. And then, of course, he got another one at Snetterton. Yeah, Snetterton. So... Yeah. You know, the list goes on and on and on, really. Um, there the, the weren't, you, you didn't really come away from anywhere thinking that was a dull race, that was a bad meeting, because as ever, um, even without the, the option tyre this year, maybe that was something that, that, that proved we didn't need it. Um, pretty much every race had something in it. Um, we didn't have any real dull ones. We had somewhere perhaps it wasn't as frantic as others, but you're always going to get that. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, I think the, the, the season as a whole was really, really good. Of course, yeah, definitely. So what would you say, which drivers impressed you the most? You've got to say Ash. You've got to say Colin Turkington, because obviously by fighting for a championship, they were doing a, a, a fantastic job. Um, and funnily enough, I did a, a, an interview just before Christmas for Auto Car Magazine. And one of the questions was, who was your sort of most improved and or surprise of, of the year? You've got to say Ollie Jackson. Yeah, um, I, I agree yeah. completely. Yeah, you know, he, he it, and it wasn't a one-off, which which gives him extra kudos in all of this. Silverstone, he, he he got the lead, lost the lead, had to get it back. And bear in mind, that was a restarted race anyway, so he had to yeah. think about it, go again after that big crash for, for Rory Butcher. Um, and he was under huge pressure all the way from Oliphant in that restarted race. And then he did it again at Snetterton. Very different type of circuit, much longer lap, much twistier lap. And again, under huge pressure all the way from Adam Morgan. And... It, it does rather show that you can't necessarily pigeonhole a driver too soon. Um, again, you, you take the likes of Butcher, you take the likes of Tom Ingram, you take the likes of, of, of Ash, uh, Jack Goff as another, op you know, the list goes on, all these young guns, they're still developing. They're, they're good and they're going to get better. And Ollie Jackson's the same and he's good and has got better and will continue to get better. Uh, so it's unfair perhaps when you look at drivers' results and, and you write them off too soon. Um, there's somebody that with enough seat time and the right car has just got on with it, learnt and learnt and learnt. And those two drives were exceptional. They were really good. So he was probably one of my um, standout drivers of the year. Others, it's hard, to, it's hard to, to, to add to that list in some ways because yeah. lots of drivers were inconsistent and they were inconsistent either because of their own driving or mechanical dramas. Um, and it's very... By saying all of the next bit, it sounds like I'm having a go at people, and I'm not. But you know, Tom Ingram started the year was a bit up and down. He was quick, but um, got involved in an incident at Brands, and then he had his warm-up lap um, drive shaft break at Alton Park. And you know, was was that down to him and that that practice crash with Ollie Brown? Was that down to the team? Uh, discuss um, all those Hondas at Brands in August on that really really hot day on the Grand Prix circuit yeah. with power steering dramas. You know, that was a big blow to, to, to BTC and Dynamics and AMD, who had reliability dramas. Um, that was almost the team letting them down. So at the start of the season, you had 
the front wheel drive teams almost committing Harry Carey and giving away points while the rear wheel drive WSR and, and later tools racing were, were just banking points um, and so it's hard to know who the other standout drivers were because in many ways they were being let down by circumstance possibly mechanically related um, over those first few rounds where the front wheel drive teams just did not come out consistently enough to score points yeah definitely so when when did you start commentating? When did you realise this is something you want to do as a career? Um, I don't think I ever thought of it as a career. I thought of it genuinely as a way to get into Alton Park for free, which was my home circuit. <laughs> um, because I used to go and sit at Nickerbrook, which in those days used to have a, a, a different sort of spectator area than, than now because the gravel traps have been moved back, so there's less viewing area. Um, but... Um, the, the, the honest answer to the question goes back to 1984 and the British Grand Prix and I was 12 and on the Friday this was in the days where they'd have Friday um, practice Johnny Giacotto had a big accident out at Westfield he was Ayrton Senna's Tolman teammate that year and there was a red flag and um, in those days the track commentator would have to fill airtime and uh, the man that was filling all that time under the red flag was Brian Jones, who passed away on New Year's Day, yeah. and very sadly. And, and, and uh, as Brian was talking, and, and no little 12-year-old was sat with his dad, I was either correcting or heckling or chipping in. And my father, probably to <laughs> shut me up, said, you ought to do this. You think you know it all. And I thought, hey, that's not a bad idea. Anyway, it was 18. I was 18 when I started doing circuit commentary. And by the end of that year, I did some TV stuff for Eurosport on the RAC rally, um, which meant actually sitting in a studio in Paris to do it. And the pictures came in and you voiced them in Paris. Um, and then I started doing bits and bobs for a production company called Hay Fisher Productions from 92 onwards, plus lots of circuit stuff. And then in terms of touring cars, I'd done the track commentary on and off for, for years and years and years. Um, and it was the start of 2013. When, when I took over. Ben had gone off to do Formula One, Ben Edwards. Toby Moody did it for a year. And then um, Toby was sort of on, on a bit of a dilemma, really. He'd, he'd been offered a, a big chunk of motorbike work, which meant that if he did touring cars as well, he'd be losing half of that bike season. And if he did the bike season, he'd be losing you know, six tenths of the touring car season. Therefore, he couldn't do both. So he elected to stand down from touring cars. and. Um, and probably with a surname starting with A, people didn't need to look too far down the list. Oh, you'll do, you do it. So, um, so yeah, 2013 onwards for, for, for doing ITV, but I've done you know, since then and before um, Block Pan Endurance Series, now GT World Challenge Europe. Um, we used to do Motors Live TV race days. I did some V8 supercar racing for, for Channel 7. I did a, a round in Bahrain. And I used to go to Australia and do some of the circuit commentary on V8s for Bathurst and a few other events and you know, all sorts of weird and wonderful things over the years. Um, so, um, yeah, lots of people probably had no idea who I was until I started doing touring cars. But um, I'd been doing lots of other things sort of hidden away or um, a bit niche for a long, long time. Mm. Yeah, it's funny you say that because obviously even now you do you commentate on all sorts of different stuff, obviously with ITV, motorsport. Uh, have you got a favourite to, to commentate on? No, I, I should say touring cars, I know, but I, I like <laughs> motor racing, in general, yeah. motor sport. Um, uh, so, uh, no, I, I don't have any particular favourite one over the other, because as long as it's a good race, um, I enjoy it. And I enjoy, as an example, I enjoy what touring car racing gives you, because it's short, sharp, action all the way. You know, the lights go out, we take a deep breath, and after about half an hour, <laughs> you can breathe out. I enjoy doing... Block Pan GT races um, or GT World Challenge Europe as, as they now are because you've got to do something different you've got to think about strategies you've got to think about when that car's pit stop is due or um, where it is in relation to that car and who's got to pit first we did a race at Paul Ricard three or four years ago and within the first half an hour there was a, a full course yellow or a safety car period I forget which but the leading Mercedes pitted okay half an hour of a six hour race and mike scott who is the the producer for the tv for sro um said to me on the tour back have they just won or lost this race by pitting now you think hang on a minute i'm not i've, I've got to work this out and talk at the same time so yeah. i'm frantically trying to work out when they would be pitting for the rest of this six hour race when the others are going to pit on the hour mark and and 
it, you get quite a buzz, if you like, out of that challenge of having to almost be in a limited way, um, uh, like a team engineer trying to trying to second guess pit stops or work out when pit stops are coming. So I quite enjoy that challenge. Um, I enjoy doing Goodwood because it's such a variety of car and you can reminisce and, 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 and you can also see things that even as an old fart like me, I've not seen before, you know, you go to the festival of speed and there are always new things um, yeah. coming out of garages and um, cars that haven't been seen for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. That's, that's, that's extraordinary. Um, I enjoy track racing. I've done the, the, the German truck Grand Prix live stream for the last three or four years. And again, it's something completely different. Um, I enjoy rallycross. I enjoy doing the, the Wales Rally GB uh, World Championship round as a, as a public address commentator because it's something different. Um, and, and, and it's when you add all that together, you, you understand the variety that motorsport in the UK or worldwide can offer. Um, all of them have, have different positives and are all enjoyable in many different ways. Yeah, definitely. So what advice would you give to anyone that's wanting to, to start commentating on motorsport well first of all why do you want to do it why does one want to do it because lots of people that have spoken to me in the past want to go and work in formula one that's okay that's not saying you shouldn't um but why would you want to be a commentator first of all and, and have a think about what that task involves because the easy bit is from the lights going out to the chequered flag being waved. The hard bits are when you've got a stoppage, when it's a dull race also. For example, you know, we've had GT World Challenge Europe races where we've had lengthy safety cars or red flags. Think about the uh, Bahrain Grand Prix and Romain Grosjean's accident and, and the delay there that you've got to keep talking through. We've had them in, in touring cars. So the easy bit is talking about the race. And it's not a case of, of telling people how much you know, although you have to know your stuff, it's about in many ways not making people change channel so you've got to be knowledgeable but you've also got to try and entertain you've got to try and hold people's interest now if you're if, if you reckon you can do all of that and, and and you want to do it um then probably one of the, the the good starting points is to try and do some circuit commentary public address commentary because that's a very good way of commentating and also being the producer um, finding things to talk about and talking about them. Uh, obviously, for TV, you're a bit limited to what the pictures are. Um, yeah. So if we're looking at Camish versus Ingram, there's no point me talking about what happened in 1975 um, in the Championship Showdown because it's utterly irrelevant. And people think, well, what's he on? Let's get back to this. <laughs> if you're doing it for public address, it's a bit like the radio. You you have this freedom to to find a battle to talk about to to find whatever you want to, to make that race interesting. Um, it's where I came from. It's where um, Ben Edwards came from and, and, and a few others have come from a circuit commentary background before television. So it's a very good breeding ground. It's a very good training ground. Um, but also have a go at doing some TV stuff for YouTube uh, or, or, or you know, off the internet, record it. You might put it on a YouTube channel. You might not want people to hear it to begin with. But if you are going to do that and, and do a, a sort of mock TV commentary, then listen back to it and sit and think to yourself and be brutally honest with yourself. Could I listen to that for half an hour, for two hours, for three hours, for a whole day, if that were on television? Because the danger is that, that, that people have a go at it and play it to a family member or a friend and they say, oh yeah, that's really good. In, in that way that when you're, she just walked through my door, when, when my eight year old brings me a, a picture and says, daddy, do you like this? And so, yes, of course, it's really good. And you think, what on earth is it? Um, <laughs> But you have to be positive, but yeah. be brutally honest with yourself because, you know, you will listen to things, um, whether it's on, on the internet or whether it's on television, that you're completely comfortable with. And, and there are things that you listen to and you think, oh, no, that doesn't sound right. Or no, um, you've got to be comfortable to listen to that. Uh, and so if you are going to do um, a sort of trial run as a commentator, then listen back to it and be brutally honest with yourself. And you know, is that of a standard that, that people are going to want to listen to? If you think it is, then you know, start hawking um, a showreel around to people or some, some demo <laughs> tapes and, and, and see what can be done. It's not, not easy. You know, for some people, the cards fall right. There's an element of being in the right place at the right time. You can write a, a hundred letters and get nowhere. You could get lucky. Um, uh, you know, my, my link with, with doing SRO television, um, even though I'd done track commentaries for them, um, I, I, I went to 
um, Harama for a Super League um, race, doing the old football themed single seater series. And SRO was there with GT3 as a support race. And uh, so I'd, I'd, I'd been asked to go and do Super League, and this guy came over to me and said, "Look, we're we're here with with GT3. Um, you know, would you mind doing our races as well?" Not, not a problem because I was probably more knowledgeable about those cars than than Super League. And on the back of that, he asked me if I'd go and do that year's Spa 24 Hours. And on the back of that race, the what was called Blanc Pan Endurance Series was born. And they said, "Well, look, you did the the sort of um, trial run race, as it were. You, you better come and do the championship." right place right time you know i could have written letter after letter after letter got nowhere um right place right time just you know you don't know you might it, it might be like banging your head against a brick wall it, you, you might get lucky um so th- there is no easy answer to how to get involved in it because like i say um uh, it, it's 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 down to the to have been a luck it's also down to to the personal preference of the person that's employing you they may not like your voice they may have no vacancies at the time you know there are lots of variables that you just can't really control but stick at it and um and persevere that's also part of it yeah so you you well, obviously when you're in the, the commentary box with itv um how difficult is it i remember seeing a video on youtube one time with you and paul o'neill at, um not kill and you're talking about how many how many different voices you have in your ears at times about people different uh, different people talking or how, what's that like sort of right. well it's, it's one of those things you get used to um really which isn't meant to sound arrogant or blase about it but but you know it's part of your job and, and genuinely you do get used to it so what um what, what we have in the the normal commentary booth um for a start i've got six televisions to look at so i've got three on either side of me um on a, on a sort of totem pole uh and they are showing pictures and timing um the way that itv does it is that there's one group of people filming what's uh, out of what's called the race truck so they film the race and then we have another group of people that are in charge of the presentation so uh, that's steve ryder's links and, and luigi's interviews and paul's bits and bobs so at the end of a race the um the, the race director from itv sort of hands the production over to the presentation director uh, and he then takes control of his cameras. And so I've got one screen for race and one screen for prez, as it's known. And then I've got timing pages. And I've got another screen with the com cam uh, on it. So we, Tim and I know when we're in vision. So we've got six screens, first of all, to worry about. And then I've got lots of voices. So there's the director from race. And he's got a spotter. So that's two voices I've got in my ear. I've got Tim, who's next to me. That's three. I can hear myself, obviously, because you get your own volume. And then out of the other truck, um, you've got the uh, director for the presentation side. Um, there will be a PA who might count you in and out of breaks or tell you how long there is left on a VT. I've got the series editor who can quickly say, uh, right, you know that VT you're going to queue in 30 seconds, we're going to drop that because we're running out of time or the green flag lap's yeah. going to start early. So I've got him. Uh, then I've got the driver that we can talk to on green flag laps. And if I want to turn up the volume permanently on that, I've got his engineer talking to him as well. So where am I up to? Seven or eight? I've lost count. <laughs> um, how much of that you process is pretty much up to you. Obviously, you can turn volumes down. Um, the main talkback will come from the race camera director, um, who will be calling which camera, which battle to go for next. Now, uh, I keep that what's called open in, in qualifying, so I can hear all of that chatter. On race day, I turn that off, and it becomes what's called keyed talkback. So the guy has to press a button to talk to me because it's just less distracting with everything else that's that's going on but yeah you, you can have something like six voices potentially in your ear at any one time um the biggest challenge really is 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 with open talk back because you've got to try and blank out all the things that aren't relevant conversation between the director and the cameraman or an instruction to a cameraman um but any second the, the instruction could be for you like you know Right, now we're going to have an onboard lap or uh, talk about this car. Uh, so equally, you tend to say to the director, can you say my name or Tim's name when it's specifically for us? And we'll, we'll kind of tune back in. Um, but yeah, when, when there's half an hour of, of chatter in your ears during a qualifying session, it does get quite busy. And occasionally you'll, you'll, you'll know when it's open talk back because 
one of us will say something and we've only half heard it because of what's going on in our ears. So you might say, oh, so-and-so has gone fourth quickest and, and, and that sparks something. You look at oh, fourth quickest, aren't you? So, and then Tim or I will say what the other one has said because you've kind of half heard it over all that talk back. But um, uh, largely we get through it without too much drama. And of course you've got like, you need all the information for each, each driver and team and, and results and whatever. How, how do you go about remembering all of that? Um, I end up with lots and lots of bits of paper. I love paper. Um, I, I, I'm not one of these modern iPad people. Um, so I, I like bits of paper all over the place. Um, I have one uh, chart of who's got pole positions. I've got one piece of paper that tells me when the last win by a driver was. Another one for the last win by a manufacturer. Um, I've got a spreadsheet that I update round by round of, of where people finished. And then on race day, I tend to have a, a sort of master entry list in front of me that will give me um, uh, space for me to, to write down their best result this year, where they qualified for that round, the first race, uh, race results during the day, um, total number of wins. So I can quickly look at that um, and, and also space to, to make some scribbles. But a lot of it, you, you kind of need to keep in your head anyway. So if, for the sake of argument, um, you know, Matt Neal is heading for a, yet another race win and it happens to be in his you know where's he likely to be up to now one millionth <laughs> rate or something. um you know you, you need to carry some of that in your head because if you think oh yeah matt neil now how many races has he done and you start delving into your traveling library by the time you've gone through all your matt neil bits of paper you know you might be in the gravel you might have lost the lead he, he might have set a new record you know you, you miss things so you, you need to have the, the bones of it in your head. So when you look at something, it's to check a fact. It's not to go and research it because you just don't have time for that, especially in touring cars where everything's happening so fast. So like you said earlier, you came into British touring cars in 2013, which is the same year where I started following it. Um, <laughs> but what, are there any races that you'll, you'll always remember watching or that they always stick out for you? Well, the first weekend will always stay in my mind because that was quite a quite a weekend you know it was it was almost being thrown into the not the lion's den that's unfair but you know it was um a weekend that uh was was obviously important because i was the new kid for for itv's block and um i needed to do a good job and and uh, i remember it being a bitterly cold weekend i was going down with the lurgy um and um yeah that was quite a, a, a high pressure weekend if you like and equally the end of that season um when andrew jordan won the championship if you remember it was a day where he'd started well in the middle race he got caught up with as he then was um uh, aaron smith had damage retired uh fought back in the third race and won the championship and uh, uh, mike jordan i've known for a hundred years and i've known the, the family i've known andrew for a long long time and seen him if you like growing up and um i know what the family had been through to to get andrew to that point and I've said it before, it's not a great secret, but that moment in Park Ferme after AJ had won the championship and he and Mike gave each other a massive hug yeah. was one of those moments where if I got the enormity of it, imagine what it must have been like for them. So that that whole day, um, and it was a great result, as I say, because they were friends and to win the championship, that, that was all fantastic. But then you start to, to work in the panic and you get relationships with people and perhaps it's more the results that stick out rather than individual races. So um Bert Taylor at BTC to watch Bert come from the back of the grid to 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 win with um and Lloyd wasn't it at Croft was was quite a moment because Bert massive enthusiast um I remember going to find at the end of that race at Croft and he was almost in a daze he was sat on his own in his camper and could barely take it in and and was you know just if, if moments like that you can't you can't script you can't not make up um a bit the same when when speedworks had its first win um yeah. and, and and you know christian dick's become a, a, a good friend and i went to say well done and he said what the have we just done <laughs> you know, again he was trying to get everything to sink in um we have had some great races that's not to say it's all down to the people normally donnington's deliver great races um silverstone even though the drivers hate the national circuit always gives pretty good racing um the easiest way really to answer your question is to, to say the, the one bad meeting in all that time was probably the Alton Park full international circuit in what year was really? that? 15 and 16, where yeah. it just, it just didn't seem to work. Um, Alton's 
pretty narrow these days for touring cars um, and you need the island bend hairpin to dive up the inside and with a bit of elbows out force the issue but the international circuit where they went to the, the bank they go right Shell, around don't they yeah yeah that just didn't work and i think even before the end of the day alan goward had acknowledged that yeah next year we'll we'll you know we tried it didn't work we'll go back to the uh the other iteration of the circuit but i think that was probably about the only day where we've come away thinking hmm, that wasn't great yeah um but um out of you know whatever it's been you know, seven eight seasons that's not a not a bad strike rate yeah absolutely we've definitely got some some good circuits in the uk have you got a favorite um, I should say Alton Park because it's twenty minutes down the road, and it's yeah. and it's where I went, you know, in nineteen seventy seven as a five year old, and it's where, in, in a sense, it all started. But um, Donington, I always have loved. Thruxton, I've always enjoyed because they're both circuits that give good racing. Silverstone, I I, I feel a bit parochial towards. Um, so I, it's it's hard to pin my colours to one mast of a of a British circuit. Um, but um, those would be three that would be up at the top of the list. Definitely. Um, and now, I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this, but as like the commentator for British Touring Cars, are you allowed a favourite driver? I think I'm allowed a favourite driver as long as nobody knows who it is. Right, um, okay, I see. <laughs> I, I think, you know, if... if um, it's, it's strange. I mean, over the years, I've, I've I've had different people accuse me of bias towards all sorts of people. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, uh, and, and and that's teams as much as drivers. Um, do I have a favourite driver? As as a well, it, again, you could split that into either a person or a, a driver who I admire. Yeah. Um, yes, I think I could probably um, pinpoint a driver that I admire, perhaps above the others. Uh, do I have a favourite driver as a, as a personality, as a character? Not really, because there are drivers I get on with to different levels in different ways. Um, I mean, they're all a pretty good, friendly bunch. Um, yeah. So it's hard, really, in that respect, to place one over the other. But, um, yeah, I think if, if you were to look at, at drivers' CVs, um, you could work out which one probably stands above the others. Definitely, and I think... Obviously, since 2013, you've been commentating on touring cars. Have you had a favourite season overall um, that you've, you've, you've commentated on and followed? I'm tempted to say the next one, because yeah. <laughs> although the, 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 the history of the BTCC is rich, you know, it's been going effectively since 1958. Um, and yes, we have had some great races and great seasons. Um, it continues to deliver great racing and great seasons. And so let's not keep looking back um you know 13 was a great year 14 was a great year 15 was a great year 16 so on, on goes the list on goes the list we haven't had one championship season where it's fizzled out with um two three events still to go you know at worst we've gone into the last race out of 30 or yes, yes 30. We, we still went down to the wild last year in 27 um so if, if it's taken 29 races to give you a champion out of 30, that's still a pretty good yeah, season. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, I've, I've oddly enough been writing some words today about Formula One in 1971 and how the world championship was done and dusted with five races to go. You know, we, 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 we never get to that point in the BCCC. You would also say that for each of those seasons, you couldn't really say that the champion did not deserve to win it, which for me is further evidence that the championship delivers. But yes, the next season, what 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 do we get now? You know yeah. what happens next. Um, two or three years ago, we were lauding seventeen different race winners. Um, we, we've just discussed the fact that you've had a works team and an independent team going head to head, and the independent team has won. What next from the VTCC? Um, you know we've got some new cars, driver shuffles, um, switches around on the entry list coming up for twenty twenty one. So yeah, let's look forward, and and I think the the, the season i want to talk about most is is the next one see what it delivers next yeah well absolutely obviously this is quite an exciting time i always think because we've all this is always an interesting time where all the teams are announcing their new drivers or or changes to the team i i think that's very exciting always to to look out for it is um and you know you, you because of, of being involved in it you tend to hear things 
ahead of other people, which you have to bite your lip about. Um, and there are things that, that, that still come as a surprise. So some of the entry list and how it's been evolving, I've known about for a while, but there are still a few gaps there that, that I haven't got to the bottom of. I think there are still a few more surprises to come out. Um, so it, it, it will be a good year. You know, we've, we've got, um, as I keep saying, people moving from one team to another and um, some of those new cars. I was like the Hyundai's, like the Ford Focus, like the, the Toyota Corolla, which admittedly will be a year ahead in terms of development. Um, you know, they, they should be even more competitive, better sorted going into next year. So uh, there are lots of reasons to expect that we should have even more cars fighting up front regularly. And with what I'm hearing um, and, and some of those driver shuffles, it's going to be fascinating. Uh, what happens with, with the, the, the Team Hard, Laser Tools Racing, BMR, um, aspect remains to be seen um, and, 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 and what difference that will make if any to, to the success of the infinities the pace of the infinities um, but yeah there's certainly enough on that grid plus the return of Power Max Racing and, and Jason Plato uh, to give us yet another very very good season and hopefully hopefully it'll be in front of a big crowd once again yeah that'd be that'd be brilliant I'll, I'll come I'll come say hello if, if crowds are <laughs> Cards are back. Do. <laughs> um, obviously, I don't want to take too much of your time, so we'll uh, finish in a minute. But which drivers do you think we should definitely look out for next year to be to be up there fighting again? Now, let me see if I've been really organised here because I printed out, I think, an entry list earlier on, or, or <laughs> my my self-made entry list. Uh, no, I didn't print it out. I was going to be flippant and, and just. Just wave that at you, really, okay. really because it's everybody, pretty yeah. much. You know, th 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 there are so many um, driver-car combinations. You know, you've got to be pretty unkind to somebody to, to write them off, even for a, a, you know, a podium place, top six place. Um, yeah, OK, there are one or two you could say aren't going to have the, the, the absolute pace, but you would, you would straight away put WSR, Motorbase, Dynamics and Speedworks all up there as potential champions, I would have thought. Now, who have I missed out of all of that? Sicily with the BMWs ought to be going for race wins. Yeah. Accelerate with the Hyundai's ought to be up there going for race wins. Um, BTC, certainly Josh Cook, possibly for the championship. Michael Kreese ought to be able now to get race wins. Um, you know, BTC's had a bit of a winter of turmoil, but I think that's now settled down and Michael's got um, another year of experience under his belt and he's with Josh Cook that helps to, to mentor him, to, to coach him. That should be a team uh, making steps forward. There's Team Hard slash Laser Tools Racing. Um, you've also got these new Coopers that Team Hard is running. So they should be up there. Um, Power Max Racing back. That'll be interesting because, okay, the car, one of the cars was running last year, but with that revolving door of drivers, uh, does it matter that Jason's been on the sidelines for 12 months? Is he going to be rusty? Probably not. Um, I'm sure he, he, he's expecting to come out all guns blazing so you write him off at your peril um, who have I missed out really by going through the teams I can't think there are many <laughs> but that aren't going to be up there um, ultimately I think you, you're probably looking at Dynamics WSR um, Speedworks possibly Motorbase possibly BTC in, and, and potentially Laser Tools again because they just proved they can do it um, in fighting for a championship but it's not just what you do it's what other teams other drivers do you need everything to align um, you know you need a good season but you also need other teams to have a bit of bad luck along the way um, and that's another of the variables that you can't control that makes the BTCC so fascinating year on year yeah it's good to see despite everything all the difficulties we're going through in the world at the minute and Obviously, financially, it, it must have been tough for lots of teams last season. But they all seem to be making steps forward, you know, bringing new cars in, getting new drivers. It, it's, it's good to see. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the one consolation to everybody is that this ghastly pandemic ain't going to last forever. Um, we don't know how long it will last. But bit by bit, there are hints of optimism. Um, and gradually, people are starting to think, well, the world's got to carry on somehow. So... Yes, we need to adapt for sponsors. You know, we, we proved last year we can go racing, yeah. whether it's with a crowd or without. Um, yes, the teams desperately want and need crowds back so they can have their hospitality guests back because many of those are writing the checks and, and, and everybody knows that. 
but you've got the next best thing, which is television. And, and of course, last year it was announced that there was a, an extension of the ITV television deal. So and a, kind of if all else fails, um, there is that, that element you can say, sell to a sponsor that you've got this extension to the television deal. But yeah, the, the teams are pushing forward. We've got hybrid coming in, of course, in the future. Yes, yeah, definitely. So the championship's not standing still. The teams can't stand still. Um, they're pushing, they, they you know, we, we, we talk even at the longer circuits of hundreds and thousands of seconds separating cars. Yeah. Um, so they, they have to be competitive and they have to evolve. And as, as one manufacturer, or one team brings a new shape onto the grid, like that very slippery BMW, how do we combat that? So BMR looked at the alternative, slippery infinity, go with that. Um, Sicily have, have forsaken that somewhat boxy Mercedes shape for a BMW and they told me the logic at, at Brands last year and they said well look at the championships that the BMW has, has won yeah it, it can't be a bad car it's got to be it's got to be winning them for a good reason um so the championship doesn't stand still it only takes one team or manufacturer to to do something different to start winning to show an advantage and everybody wants to follow suit and everybody needs to follow suit to stay on the pace yeah. Well, thank you so very much for coming on. This has been this has been really cool right. to to talk to you. <laughs> My and, pleasure. Uh, yeah, I've definitely look forward to next next season, whether we're watching at home on the TV or or trackside. Uh, I look forward to it. Well, the the, the ideal would be both. Um, both. Yeah, that would be brilliant. The people trackside. Set your videos to record it and then watch it when um, when you get home. So um, fingers crossed, we'll we'll go back to a, a rather more normal BTCC. If not for the first round, maybe certainly by mid season. But yeah, fingers crossed. But um, let's look forward because twenty twenty one should be yet another great season for touring cars. Yes, definitely. Thank you so very much. My pleasure. No problem. See you soon. Bye, Louis. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.